So today is our first podcast and I'm fittingly joined by Doug Stryachik. Doug is seen as a rock star in the, the mental toughness world. He's pioneered the application of mental toughness to a wide variety of sectors. He's seen as one of the leading authorities worldwide on the application of the four C's mental toughness model. Doug works in occupational, educational, social work, sport, health in more than 80 countries. He's also the CEO for AQR International, an experienced author who's contributed to a number of books that look at developing mental toughness and resilience. That's quite a, a lengthy introduction, a bit of a mouthful. Welcome, Doug. Thank you, David. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> and I'm, I'm pleased uh, that you can join us on the, on the podcast today. It's, it's fantastic. And I'm sure you're going to be able to share some, some great, great insights into, into mental toughness. Well, I'm better after that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you are. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, so the plan for today is ultimately is to look at the background behind the, the 4Cs model also going to discuss the current climate and the additional stress and pressures people are under and the impact it has on people because even if you're mentally tough it's still it's still quite testing for you to say the least and and also we'll go on to talk about the importance of mental toughness and Doug will share some top tips to help you so yeah mental toughness is often misunderstood would you would you say that's right Oh, that's very much the case David much less so than when we started in 2002 in 2002, people looked at that term toughness and said, oh, that sounds macho, sounds very masculine. Well, it isn't about being macho and it isn't about being masculine. Um, just to kill one myth, uh, we know that the mental toughness profiles for male, men and women are virtually identical. So it's definitely not a male concept. See, it's, it seems to apply equally. Well, it does apply equally to males and females. But the essence of it is really the word mental. This is about how we respond mentally to things that happen to us. So it's about our mindset, our mental responses. It isn't about being macho or, or tough in that sense of the word. It's about being tough in the resilient sense of the word. And it's important. It's always been important. It's probably especially important at this time because we're more concerned usually about our mental responses at times of stress, pressure, crisis and chaos. And pretty much that's where we are right at the moment. But it's always important. You go back, in fact, two and a half thousand years. Uh, the first reference to it is from Plato. Plato spoke about fortitude being one of his four virtues. And the four virtues still feature in a lot of Western philosophy to this day. He spoke about fortitude. When you look at what he was talking about, he was basically talking about an attitude of mind. And we know that what he was talking about was very, very close to what we describe today as mental toughness. And we know that because he related fortitude to the idea of contentment, which is psychological well-being, rather than to happiness which could be a very transient state. So he understood the fundamental importance of fortitude or mental toughness. But then it took nearly two and a half thousand years for people to kind of work out what it was. We've always known it's important. You know, you go to organizations and you say, what's more important, knowledge or skills or attitude? It's always attitude. And this is what we're really talking about here. Do you have an attitude that makes the most of your knowledge of sk and skills because if you've got the wrong attitude you won't use them so if we come up to the present day i've been working for almost 30 years with professor peter clough there's been a number of researchers looking at what this what is this concept mental toughness but peter was the first to sort of get under the skin of the subject <laughs> and he worked out that it had four key elements which psychologists call constructs and that's control commitment challenge and confidence and control really is describing the extent to which you feel in sufficient control of your life and your circumstances to be able to achieve what you want to achieve that doesn't necessarily mean you're in control of everything you just feel that you're in control of enough and it's like a, a measure of self-worth you know, I think I can do it. In fact, 
the can-do concept sits there. Commitment is about the extent to which I like working to goals and I'll do whatever it takes to achieve those goals. And those two elements uh, together really represent what we would commonly call resilience. Now I'm bringing resilience into play here so that people can understand there is a relationship between resilience and mental toughness. But mental toughness is a much wider concept and it's generally a more fundamentally valuable concept. So resilience is simply, well, the, te the textbook definition is the ability to recover from an adverse situation. And the, the way that the definition's phrase tells you it's a passive concept. So it's describing your reaction. So something's happened, it's knocked me off my feet, can I pick myself up, dust myself off and carry on going? And we know that's down to those two elements, control and commitment, that I've just described. However, what we've found since, and there's a lot of evidence for it, is that some of us are, do a little bit more than adopt a resilient approach. Resilience helps you to survive, but a lot of us seem to thrive when the, the going gets tough. So what are those elements that bring this capacity to, to thrive, to play? And the first one is challenge. And challenge is simply talking about do, when things go wrong, do I just see the downside? Do I just see the problem? Or do I see the opportunity? And do I see the, the solution? So some of us get paralyzed by what's, what's happening, but others will say, hang on, I know it's all gone wrong, but look, there's a bit of blue sky over here. And those people, are bringing a, a positive element to what we describe as resilience. And of course, the other element that brings positivity is confidence. So if you have self-belief, because that's what confidence is all about, and you have self-belief in your key abilities and capabilities, then you know you're going to be able to deal with whatever happens, if, no matter how bad it is, and perhaps even emerge thriving. So those two elements, confidence and challenge, bring the element of positivity to resilience. And Peter Clough will often say, resilience is the element that helps you to survive, hang on by your fingertips, but mental toughness is the, the element that enables you to thrive, to make the most of the situation that you're in and come out hopefully with a bit of a smile on your face. So that's a very quick run round the, the mental toughness concept. Since Peter did that work, we've been able to dig down to another level. And that's been fundamentally important because we had to understand where did these constructs come from that we've been able to go down to another level, the, the factors that make up those constructs. And under control, we've got life control and emotional control. Life control is where can do sits. Emotional control is the extent to which I will manage my emotional responses or do I let my emotions run me. With commitment, it splits neatly into goal orientation or achievement orientation. In other words, do I know where I'm going and will I do whatever it takes to get there? Challenge, it's risk orientation, that seeing the opportunity and maybe having a go. And learning orientation, Maybe that didn't work, but did I learn something from it? And then confidence is about confidence and abilities. And that's really interesting because we all have abilities, but we don't have self-belief. Very often we won't use those abilities. And that's what this is really capturing. And then there's interpersonal confidence. And that's really about the extent to which I'm prepared to influence others as much as they will try to influence me. So... We can go down to that level and that level is very very important because what we know is those eight factors that i've just described are all independent in other words you can be high on one low on the other you can change one but it won't necessarily change another they're independent and there are about forty thousand combinations of those factors which means we can do something that's quite unique in people development and organizational development. We can get down to working with the individual and their needs. And that's becoming 
more and more important as we're moving away from a one size fits all approach to development. But I think maybe having done that, David, perhaps we can start talking about how it's used. I'm pleased you mentioned the, the difference between resilience and mental toughness there because a lot of people get that, get them mixed up. They just use the words hand in hand. Clearly, yeah, resilience is, is more, more of a reaction to, to an event, whereas mental toughness is, is a lot more complex. And in order to, to help, help the development of people and for organizations, there's, there's a lot of factors to be taken on board. And it, it's, very, yeah, it's very, very much a proactive approach. Uh, it should be. It's been one of the big challenges in getting mental toughness out there as a concept for people to understand it. So you've captured the two elements of it. Uh, one is everybody's familiar with the word resilience and they know that it kind of fits into this space and so they automatically default to that. But resilience is actually quite a narrow concept. And the other one is um, this, the widening and linking mental toughness to other concepts. So we can see how it links to resilience, but people are also familiar with concepts like mindset, with grit, with positive psychology. If you know anything about any of those, you can use that framework and you can position all of those concepts on that, that framework. And what's emerging is that Peter Clough pretty much managed to capture a big picture that captures and joins up a lot of ideas. So instead of running around thinking we've got three or four different ideas, we've actually got one big idea here. And if we can see how it joins up, uh, or how these d different ideas join up where well, we can be mo much more effective it's fair to say as well if you're if you're mentally tough it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be successful or your, your well-being is going to be in a, in a great place is is that true would you say yes that's absolutely true Kit. um well there's a couple of things there is um we talk about mental toughness and we tend to use that phrase but it's actually a spectrum with mental toughness at one end and mental sensitivity at the other. And a mentally tough individual is somebody that's comfortable in their own skin. As things go wrong, they kind of take it in a stride and they know that uh, there will be light at the end of the tunnel and they work towards it. A mentally sensitive individual will respond inside their head differently. It can stop them in their tracks. It can um, knock them sideways. And it can take them a long time to recover from the sort of thing that a mentally tough person might recover from quickly but it's a spectrum and what we know is that we all have a degree of mental toughness and a degree of mental sensitivity and at first it was hard to see that and that's why it was important when we identified those eight factors what we could find is sometimes you'd find a mentally tough individual somebody who was clearly mentally tough getting on with things making it work there'd suddenly be a circumstance that stopped them in the tracks as much as it would a mental, what we would call a mentally sensitive person. And what we began to understand is, actually, you can be overall mentally tough, but you might only be mentally tough on five or six of these factors. You might actually be mentally sensitive on a couple of them. And the same is true for a mentally sensitive individual. They might be mentally sensitive on most of those factors, but they might well have some strengths in some parts of that framework but it goes a little bit deeper than that uh, because what's become almost a mantra for us is this term self-awareness because mental toughness in itself is an important and valuable concept but it's an enabler it's an enabling us to understand something about our mental approach if we can understand that that self-awareness then we can often do something about it and so what we know is that a mentally tough individual who isn't self-aware can often have significant downsides. If you've got too high a sense of control, a mentally tough individual can take on too much if they don't understand their own mental toughness. If they too high a level of commitment, and you know, especially if they're in a the leadership position, they can actually, again, take on too much, but can take on too much on behalf of other people and expect them to work hard when maybe they're not ready for it. With challenge, they can often take too many risks. They can push themselves. They can 
you know, if you're a salesperson, target a market they've actually got no experience in and you come back with the bloody notes. With confidence, um, well, if you're overconfident and you're, you're surrounded by people who haven't got the same level of confidence, you can end up completely intimidating them. And, you know, we've all, I guess we've all been in that position where we've come across somebody who's totally dynamic, walks into the room, takes over a room, and suddenly you feel, oh, this person's got something I haven't got. And you kind of shrink back a little. Well, if you've got too much of this confidence, that's what can happen. And in extreme circumstances, an overly confident person can be perceived as a bully. So there are potential downsides, but curiously, there's potential upsides in being mentally sensitive. Mentally sensitive individuals bring a different type of creativity to play in a situation. So if you want genuine creativity in an organization, you tend to listen to the people with the loudest voice, and those tend to be the mentally tough. But some of the really interesting ideas come from the mentally sensitive and we sometimes don't listen to them. So they can bring a, a very special type of creativity to play. And one of the curious upsides of their mental sensitivity is they're also very sensitive to uh, overload, to work overload. A mentally tough individual will tend to carry on going until they keel over. They don't recognize the warning signs. A mentally sensitive individual does. And a mentally sensitive individual can often see that in a team or a group. But again, if you don't listen to them, you don't get the benefit of, of their insights. So it isn't black and white. It isn't labeling. It isn't typing. Um, it is, as you say, what we try to do here is try to create the simplest microscope through which we can look at a quite a complex area. But it seems to work. The balance between complexity and accessibility and obviously at the moment we're in the in the midst of a pandemic it's a very very pressurized stressful situation for some people so being self-aware is is such a key factor in being able to make good decisions at the, at the moment and some of those traits that you've talked about i would imagine that they're being stretched to, to their extremes oh absolutely and you know, I'd actually step back a little because, you know, we, and for the right reasons, we're really concerned what's been happening over the last three or four months and what might be happening over the next few months. And we tend to have put the current situation almost on a pedestal. It's the great crisis of our time. Well, it is, but it's not the only crisis that people have been through. You know, there are people who go and work for big businesses before, long before COVID-19 came along, that have suddenly crashed. Are those, you know, the people who run those businesses, the people who are employed in those businesses, have had to go through a crisis, been pretty severe. You know, if you've lost close relatives in a car accident, you've gone through a crisis that is pretty severe. You know, and I often say, look at the people in Syria. I think they've been living in perpetual crisis for, for the last 10 years. Look at the people in New York in 9-11. That was pretty... Uh, pretty severe. So we actually, when we think about it, most of us experience several crises, big elemental crises, several times in our life. So mental toughness, our ability to deal with that is, is very important. But you're absolutely right. There are a lot of people being tested now in a way that surprises them. Well, I, can, I can illustrate it with an example. This is the mental toughness profile for a senior manager in a very big organization, big international organization, and by any standards, he was seen as extremely successful and he built a fantastic team around him, extremely successful. And COVID-19 came along, so who did the organization turn to to handle key projects? I gave it to this character. And this guy thought, all right, I'm gonna be able to deal with it. I've been successful at everything I've touched. In fact, uh, he started to run into trouble quite quickly. If you look at his overall mental toughness, and that he scores seven on a scale of one to ten, that would indicate he is, by general standards, 
pretty mentally tough. So that would suggest he can deal with uh, crises and is the right person to give demanding projects to. But what we can do, and this is the, the importance of the, the factors, is if we look at each of those factors, we can see that on several, on the confidence factors, he scores pretty high. On risk orientation, extremely high. On goal and achievement orientation, high. On life control, the sense of can do, high. You can see why he might be perceived, and actually is, a high performing individual. But, and this is pretty characteristic, nobody is truly, well, very few are truly mentally tough and very few are truly mentally sensitive. His, his emotional control score is at the other end of the scale. His emotional control score is in the 16% of the population that is most mentally sensitive in terms of emotional control. So what this is showing is he's not as good as most people at managing his emotions and probably allows his emotions to drive some of his behaviours. He's also got, surprisingly perhaps, a low learning orientation score. Now typically what that means is if something goes wrong, somebody with a high learning orientation score, this is where this notion of you, know, you learn more from your mistakes than from your successes comes. Well, if things go wrong, people with a, a learning orientation score at this sort of level will tend not to learn from what's happened. They don't tend to be very reflective. They tend to repeat their mistakes. So why is this person suddenly had a problem? Well, part of the answer lies here, but the other part lies in understanding what else changed for him. He had a fantastic team. That team is now, like most teams, dispersed. They're all working from home. When the team was together, if he had an emotional outburst or had a sulk or, you know, vented his spleen or whatever, the team was so used to it, they would just deal with it. They would actually, in effect, be his coaches. They would take the mickey out of him and say, oh, come on, cheer up. And he didn't need to change his behaviour because he got that kind of support from the people around him. Sat at home on his own, it's a different story. That escape mechanism or that coping mechanism isn't there. And similarly, when the coach worked with this individual, bit by bit, began to realise he wasn't as reflective as he thought he was. Actually, most of the reflection happened in the team. They would work through problems, they'd identify solutions, and they'd bring, in, bring them to him. Well, maybe that's you know, good leadership. That's the thing you want to do. We talk about employee engagement these days. But it did mean that when he sat at home and a problem arose, he really didn't have the kind of inclination or the right approach to be able to reflect on, on the problem. And he found himself sat at home, blips would happen, hiccups would occur, and they would frustrate him and his emotional control would come into play. So these two factors began to interplay. Now, in normal times, the environment and the team play together in a way that this didn't really matter. Suddenly, the game has changed and this person is suddenly exposed in terms of two aspects of his mental sensitivity. And that is happening a lot. We're getting lots of inquiries from around the world and i would say they fall into three categories the first one is the impact on leaders and managers in exactly this way they're suddenly finding that they're struggling or they're not finding it as easy as before and they can't understand why because they've always succeeded before well, part of the answer lies in the way you're approaching it mentally the other is actually from leaders and managers who are concerned about their staff now, a lot of people have either been sent home to work in isolation or the frontline staff and they're having to continue to work with a higher risk of exposure to the virus. Both groups are under stress, they're under pressure, and both are uncomfortable. And if you're mentally sensitive, whether you're working on your own at home or you are in the front line and having to get on with a job that you really don't want to be in today, because you don't want to catch that virus, you can suddenly begin to feel anxiety, you can suddenly start to take on the signs of depression and so on, and you won't be able to cope with it. So organisations are beginning to say, I can't actually see my staff every day, and I'm hoping that they're doing a good job, but I'm sensing that some of them 
aren't dealing well with the situation. How can I assess that? And if I can assess it and identify which ones are struggling, what can I do about it? So that's interesting, but you have to be a caring employer to do that. But the third one is intriguing me because we do get a steady stream of inquiries and that's people being a little bit more farsighted and coming to us and saying, in three or six months time, we're going to get back to normality, whatever that looks like. And at that point, we've got a hell of a lot of ground to catch up. I want my staff, my teams, my employees to come back and I want them sprinting. I want them at 100% but I don't know what state they're in. And I don't know whether they're going to be capable of you know, ramping up so quickly, but we've got a big job to do. So some people are thinking sufficiently far ahead to say, actually, I'm not sure what state my staff will be in when I pull them back together. Yeah, so ultimately they're taking the, the proactive approach and perhaps they're going to use the, what, the MTQ plus scales in, in their work and then put developmental programs in place like you say, to ensure that the staff are ready to go. Yeah, and it's, you know, the mental toughness questionnaire, as you know, David, is a comparatively short questionnaire, and it produces information quickly. But it's information that's capable of being analysed very quickly. So not only in terms of the individual, but if you tested a whole group of people, you could analyse it to see if there was different patterns in different offices or different departments. you get an idea of which managers and leaders were dealing better with their staff. You don't, want to, you don't need to wait until September, October, November to see what state they're coming, coming back in. You can see what they look like now and you can see which direction they're headed in and you can do something about it. It's not, it might be, well, it'll be difficult. It might even be too late, you know, at a future date. You know, from what you're saying there, the leaders are going to have a, the, sorry, the leaders in terms of their mental toughness or mental, mental sensitivity and the various different traits there are going to have a big impact on the culture of organisations as a whole. Oh, absolutely. And wherever we go, and this is pre-COVID-19, when we've worked in schools, we've found a direct relationship between the, the mental toughness profile for the leadership t- team the, the teaching staff and the support staff and the pupils. And it is almost every time it's like a straight line relationship where we see exactly the same in business and in organisations. It doesn't matter whether public or private sector or which sector they're in, it's exactly the same. The people at the top set a culture, set the culture. Leadership sets the culture. And two important aspects of, cult- of the culture are its resilience, how good is it at uh, dealing with knocks and organizations suffer knocks all the time and how positive is it how confident is it that it can make progress that all comes from the senior leadership team and you see just see it every time you actually see it in society you know you go i won't name names we do a lot of work in the social mobility world You can actually go to some towns that have been devastated over the years, assess the mental toughness of, we we do this primarily with um, adolescents and their teachers. And in the most deprived towns, the mental toughness profiles are much lower than in the most prosperous towns. And simply, you know, there's been a culture developing in the deprived areas that there's no hope and there's no way out of here and even if I you know, worked, worked hard and studied, there isn't a job for me. If you have that mindset, that's what's going to happen. There won't be a job for you. But there are people even in those areas who say, hang on, if I don't do this, I don't stand a chance. I'm going to give myself the very best chance I can. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to believe I can do it. I'm going to develop abilities and believe in my abilities. And I might have to take a few risks to get where I'm going. That's mental toughness. Mental toughness will help people to prosper, even in the most negative situations. It doesn't always work, but you get a much better chance of success if you adopt the elements of mental toughness. It's fascinating stuff. That's brilliant. And think, thinking about it, some of the conversations I've had recently with, with some different leaders of 
they've been like very hard working, very focused, pretty confident in the way they go about things. But if you, if you have a team like that who aren't good at stepping back, like you say, learning from mistakes and just actually reflecting, then it maybe won't necessarily end good. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it's interesting because we're kind of migrating towards uh, talking about leadership here. And then I, I think it's um, as central as, it, as mental toughness is. Peter Clough and I have been doing another set of work on uh, what we call the integrated leadership model, but it is some fundamental research on what are the elements that followers respect in the most effective leaders. And there are three things that come out. One is, we call it determination to deliver. And that's this positive view. There is a future. I know where I'm going and I'm doing everything I can and I'm focusing on getting there. It's really interesting how many people will follow a leader that shows those qualities, even if it inconveniences them. There were, people like having a sense of purpose. And the other two elements are how effective a leader is at engaging with individuals. And the third, the third element is engaging with teams. Well, even there, you can see the importance of having a mentally tough approach to life if, if you're mentally sensitive you're not really going to be highly effective at developing relationships with individuals and teams so mental toughness is very important in underpinning good leadership yeah i like that i was going to finish off asking you for uh, three big takeaways from the chat but you've you've just mentioned three three real positives there about that sense of purpose engaging with individuals and engaging with the team and if we add in yeah self awareness into that, then uh, you've got the yeah, you've got the whole package, haven't you? Really, you do. And I think self awareness is the big one. Um, we all face um, you know challenging times. I need to understand, and everybody needs to understand what it is it about them that causes them to hold back or to be confident about dealing with those challenges. And you can see, you know, you can walk, you know, you can't walk into a room anymore, but. Uh, you can see all, people all around you responding in different ways. And the reason for that will be some aspect of their mental toughness. Some things stop people in their tracks, and the next person, that same thing doesn't seem to make a difference. We can explain that difference. We understand where it is. And if you can be self-aware, you stand a chance of doing something about it. If you're not self-aware, you've got very little chance. That's a great uh, little message for people at the end there. <laughs> thanks very much for that. Pleasure, David. And again, yeah, thanks for taking the time out to, to chat. I'm sure the, the listeners will have got some great messages there. So where, where can people find you then, Doug? Right, well, uh, the website is www.aqrinternational, all one word, .co.uk. If anybody's got a query, they can obviously either come back to you, David, or they can come to head office at aqr.co.uk. And even at this time, that is monitored hourly. So if people are interested in knowing more, obviously, you know a lot about the subject, David. I know you've been quite quiet in this discussion, but you do know your stuff as well. So uh, they can either come back to you or, or to us. That's great, Doug. Thanks for sharing your expertise and your knowledge and for your kind words there at the end. Thank you, David. Thanks for the opportunity. 